right, let's go ahead and get into the story about Chris Hedges and Lee Camp, how liberal comedians became lapdogs for the establishment. Now, let's go ahead and put this up here, and I want to start off with a little intro. When I was growing up, the comedians that were around during that time, right? So there was Eddie Murphy. Actually, I didn't stick around too long. But the, the comedians we knew about, Eddie Murphy, George Carlin, uh, Richard Pryor, some of the greats, right, so to speak. One of the things I noticed about their, com their comedy is that they had no problems criticizing and attacking the establishment. Richard Pryor often spoke about what it was like growing up poor. And not just that, but growing up being poor and, and black, right? George Carlin called out everybody. <laughs> Let's just keep it real. George Carlin called out everyone. <laughs> and Eddie Murphy had a stand-up series called Eddie Murphy's Raw. And if you have never seen Eddie Murphy's Raw, that is one of the ones I will say that you should watch. But Eddie Murphy has even changed over the years when we talk about the establishment. Comedy was just different back then. Something that I have noticed if you look at some of the comedians today, a lot of them, instead of criticizing the establishment, the rich people, the government, the politicians, they seem to support it. People like a Bill Maher, right? That's a problem. Why do we think that's happening? Let's get into this discussion here with Chris Hedges and Lee Camp. Of course, Lee Camp isn't just a commentator uh, or media professional here. He's also a comedian. They perpetuate the fiction that we live in a democracy. They do not challenge the folly of permanent war from the Middle East to Ukraine. They do not call out the corporations that have deindustrialized the nation and abandoned and impoverished American workers. They attack critics of the system, even if these critics come from the left. John Oliver, for example, devoted a show to mocking Green Party presidential candidate Jill Stein. Bill Maher made public his $1 million donation to Barack Obama's 2012 campaign. These comics traffic in a self-defeating cynicism that eschews all critiques of the real configurations of power. Power only laughs at its own jokes. And these are the jokes these mainstream comics tell. Joining me to discuss the transformation of comedy from an art form rooted in the counterculture to one that has largely become a megaphone for power is Lee Camp, who, like the comics of another era, Lenny Bruce, Richard Pryor, Mort Stahl, Bill Hicks, and George Carlin, and a handful of his contemporaries, including Jimmy Dore, is not afraid to use his razor-sharp wit against our real enemies. So censorship of comics is not new. Uh, Lenny, we can go back to Lenny Bruce. Um, and also providing acerbic comics with heavy financial support to essentially buy their loyalty isn't new. But let's go back and talk in the preceding decades where we were, how that operated, and where we are now. Well, first of all, thanks for having me, Chris. Uh, it's an honor to be here, even though, you know, many of those people you mentioned in that intro, they were my heroes when I was beginning and yeah. starting out. And then yeah. I slowly got to the bottom of things, realized yeah. how the systems worked. Uh, but yeah, you're, you're right that censorship is not new. Uh, Lenny Bruce, for, for those who don't know, was essentially driven to his death. I mean, he was arrested on just about every stage he would get on to towards the end of his life uh, simply for his words, for going against religion, for going against the government, uh, making fun of police. And he couldn't make a living. He was chased. They'd threaten his venues with taking away their liquor, their liquor license. And he ultimately OD'd. But um, so this isn't new, but I, I think it's almost more insidious now because there was a very select group of gatekeepers back when there were three TV channels, you know, and and so in a way things have opened up. You can now have all this information and it's so accessible and it's it, it, comedians from nowhere can go viral on YouTube and things. But if you get far enough and your criticisms are strong enough you are not going to be accepted into those mainstream outlets. Uh, you will be banned from them. You will get uh, pushed out of the way. 
and and those are who are still there the 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 people on comedy central regularly the people on these late night shows they have made that deal with the corporations that they are not going to really question them in a in a large scale way they may have a little line here or there yep. but they're not going to get at the heart of the of the inverted totalitarian system we have let's pause here for just a second and i want to interject here because I feel like this perfect stop, uh, spot to chime in. What Lee Camp said there is very telling. When you watch Comedy Central, when you watch like some of these stand-up specials that actually make it like on HBO or people still watch HBO anymore, you have to remember that they are still on network television. So there are going to be limitations in reference to what that network or what that station allows for them to say. This is why I've noticed something with someone like a Chris Rock. When Chris Rock first started his stand-up comedy years ago, like back when I was in like high school and things like that, Chris Rock's stand-up was a little bit more raw. But even Chris Rock, for the most part, doesn't really attack the establishment. So what you have to understand is that some of these comedians that get these $20 million special stand-up deals or whatever, it, it seems like if you're not already an established name or an established brand, it is going to be very difficult for these networks to be willing to give you that type of deal. I'll throw out someone that a lot of people think is funny that I do really not think is funny. Amy Schumer, I don't think is funny. But Amy Schumer don't really got to be that funny because of two reasons. Number one, she already has an in when we want to talk about politics in this country. She's related to Chuck Schumer. For a lot of people that did not know. And two, because there aren't a lot of women that are in comedy, right? And there are very few that have their own stand up special. They kind of see it as though, OK, yes. She's going to be one of the women that gets to have that spotlight on her. But Amy Schumer already had an in when we talk about political space in this country. So are they really going to turn away Chuck Schumer's relative? The point that I'm trying to make is this. The people who are there in the spotlight that have these $20 million deals are not necessarily the funniest people. But today, they seem to be the ones that are more willing to go along with the establishment talking points that those networks and those stations will allow. And that is very important. I don't think we could see a George Carlin today. Do you think some of the things that George Carlin said during his stand-up, do you think that would be allowed? He would be given a $20 million like salary to do something like that on Comedy Central? I don't think it would happen. Let's go in. Talk about Bill Hicks. You were the one who had me watch Bill Hicks. He's who's brilliant. Yeah, um, but he's yeah. an example of that. He's he's a real great example of you know his legend has grown. Uh, he was known but not really famous in America when he died. I think it was 1994. Um, he was pretty well known in Britain then, even though he was American. But his legend has really grown because he was saying things about. The, our invasion of Iraq for the first Iraq war that held true for the second one. You know, the, how do we know they have WMD because we have the receipts? Uh, you know, those were his lines. And those were the type of things that ultimately did get him censored. Uh, his final letterman did not air famously, uh, even though they, he taped it and they still didn't air it. Um, but he he said things that were so important and he went after those corporations. He went after marketing uh, and how it manipulates message and he did it in a way that really brought large scale audiences in with laughter. Uh, it wasn't like he was losing everybody and wasn't funny. He was tremendously funny. And so his legend has really grown and, and he now ranks alongside, you know, George Carlin. Well, we should talk about Carlin because he appears to have had a pretty successful career and yet have held fast to that kind of uh you know, ability to ridicule the real centers of power. Right. Yeah. Initially, he said he had an incredibly interesting career because initially and this is the way we talked about the gatekeepers a moment ago. Initially, this if you were going to question things, the deeper things, you had to first get famous doing mm. the clean comedy that was right. allowable right. on the Ed Sullivan show and stuff like that. So if you're talking, you know, Richard Pryor and, and George Carlin are a few examples. They got fame and Lenny Bruce. They got famous 
doing that clean, nice oh. family style comedy oh. that they would allow on the late night shows or the you know the various shows. And then they started questioning themselves, and it was kind of too late for the system. Lenny Bruce was already hugely famous. George Carlin already hugely famous. But the system then realized Lenny Bruce was a risk and they started chasing him and arresting him. Um, Carlin, his big change was he realized he wasn't being himself. He wasn't being open. He was doing this clean comedy. And he had a very dramatic shift where he hated himself. And he switched everything, started using curse words on stage, uh, which got him fired from all his Vegas gigs, lucrative gigs. Uh, and for a few years was barely earning a living. But then the culture turned around. All of a sudden he got respected for being the type to push authority and push yep. against these restrictions and became hugely famous kind of again. Um, but then he wasn't at that time. He wasn't really going after kind of the the endless war state or the American uh, empire. Those weren't his criticisms. Instead, it was it was the cursing that was challenging and went all the way to the Supreme Court. It, it was a Supreme Court case as to whether his curse words could be heard on our radio stations. Uh, but eventually and. I don't hear a lot of people make this point. And the, re the reason he was allowed to do this was because HBO was a young new thing. It was subscription based. Mm -hmm. There wasn't really subscription based television happening before that much. And he was given these comedy specials where he wasn't accountable to any corporate ads. He could do they They put him up there because he was George Carlin. He did like 10 specials and they just wanted people to subscribe. So. So I'll give an example with a very pressing issue that we've all talked about the past year and a half. The war with Russia and Ukraine, right? How do you think Comedy Central, HBO, let's even throw in Netflix as well. What do you think their position would be in reference to the stand-up acts that they hire? to do these shows. Do you think that they would hire someone like a Lee Camp and let him talk about Russia and Ukraine? The only way you would probably be able to talk about it is if you're using the same narr narrative that is supported by mainstream media. Think about it. Even when I see it now, when people, comedians, and I watch comedy a lot, comedians, they talk about the war in Ukraine. They're not talking about it from the same perspective that Lee Camp is talking about it. They're not talking about both sides, the Ukraine side and the Russia side. No, they're using the same narrative that mainstream media is using. So even when we look at a conflict today, like the Ukraine war, those networks are going to be very particular about who they allow to come on or they give that deal to, to make those kind of jokes. So if you had someone like a George Carlin that was pushing back against the corporations, that was calling out the marketing, that was calling out the establishment, it was a lot different back then. You don't see that as much today. And this is something I really want people to start paying attention to if you haven't noticed it. You don't see it as much today. You'll see people, Dave Chappelle calls out Candace Owens. He'll call out, he'll make fun of White people who make fun of black people who make fun of Dave Chappelle picks on everybody. Does Dave Chappelle pick apart corporations? These are things to think about. Let's go on. He could swing for the fences and do whatever he wanted. And he did it until his death. And and he put out some of these brilliant and scathing scathing uh, uh, critiques of, of American empire, you know, jokes about how, oh, we're really good at bombing brown people. You know, those were those were the type of bits that America had never heard. And the reason he was allowed to was a because he was famous before that and b because mm -hmm. he was on a subscription rather than corporate uh, based platform. Nowadays, HBO, however, is still not going to have people that, you know, right. question Israel, question uh, yep. uh, the, the the American empire. There's also the issues with the advertisement, which is what Lee Camp was talking about. Again, they asked themselves, are the advertisers going to like this? Same thing with YouTube, right? YouTube has ads. Rockfin does not have ads. That's why you can get away with a lot more over there. But same thing. Will the advertisers like this information? Will they be okay with the message? Will they be okay with the narrative? That's what they're thinking about. But to Lee's point, when he brings up channels like HBO, this one of those subscription channels, 
even they are still more hesitant to allow that type of message to come through. If they weren't, someone like Lee Camp would be even more popular just for his comedy alone than he is, you know, right now. So that's something to consider and think about. There's one more piece here I want to play. It seems that comics, because they have catered to corporate power, advertisers laid off a serious critique of the Democratic Party uh, because of it's a kind of one-sided comedy. I'm talking about the mainstream. They've essentially uh, rendered themselves utterly ineffectual. And I think back to... Uh, there's a wonderful memoir by the Lutheran minister, uh, Martin Niemöller, who finds himself in the Dachau concentration camp, I believe it was Niemöller, with the cabaret owners from Berlin who savaged the Nazis uh, on the, in the cabaret, in the cabaret right. shows. Uh, but of course, they weren't going after the ineffectual uh, aristocratic government that didn't know how to handle the a fallout from the Great Depression or you know, had abolished unemployment insurance. It was a very similar kind of, and, and because they were uh, essentially working tacitly on behalf of the system, uh, they they didn't have any kind of real political impact. And I, and mm -hmm. I, I, I think you would agree that that's kind of uh, uh, an apt analogy for what's happening here. Yeah, it, people may look at these late night shows, uh, Colbert, et cetera, and say, what do you mean? They mock the mm -hmm. rulers all the time. They, they may even, you know, I haven't watched them recently, they may even make fun of Biden. But they're only, even if they're making fun of Biden and Trump equally, which they're not, it was more, far yeah. more heavy on Trump, but either way, they're making fun of these surface level critiques. So, you know, he's acting dumb, he fell down. It's, yep. it's never, uh, the the system writ large. It's never the American empire. It's never endless war. So as long as you have people thinking, oh, this is funny. We're making fun of the rulers. We're doing this edgy thing while never getting to the center, never getting to the the the, the critiques that could actually change things. You're still servicing the whole system. That part right there. Just because Colbert makes fun of Joe Biden here and there and they make fun of Donald Trump, that's cool. You're making they're making fun of individuals. Right. But they're making fun of the things that we can all see. It's right there on the surface. It's very apparent to to the average person. Right. They're not pointing out or, or pointing fun at the deeper rooted issues. They're not talking about the corruption, how they're both corrupt, how they're both beholding to these corporate donors. They're not making, they're not talking about that at all. And they're not making fun of it. They're not talking about the war issue, how they all seem to just sign up for a war or being pro-war, whether it's sending weapons to countries, whether it's uh, dropping drones on countries or whatever, it's whatever. They never bring up those things. And that's very important for people to really think about because at the end of the day, they're hiding information from the people. And this doesn't mean they don't know these things. Comedians are very smart. They do a lot of research, particularly for these jokes. So it doesn't mean they don't know these things. They know these things, people, but they also know that if they want to keep their job, they're not going to discuss it on these networks. And I'll give you an example with someone like Arsenio Hall. When Arsenio Hall had the Arsenio Hall show, the producers would tell him whether or not certain guests should be allowed to come onto the show. There was a guest that Arsenio Hall wanted to bring on, and that was Louis Farrakhan. And the producers told Arsenio Hall, if you bring him on this show, you're done. Arsenio Hall did it anyway, and he was done. That was the end of the Arsenio Hall show. They control the narrative. It's not just the media, right? Like, it's not just CNN, MSNBC, or Fox News. It's also the late night shows, like the Tonight Show or the Corbert Show or whatever. Those late night shows where people watch, uh, what's the guy, Jimmy? Jimmy, what's that guy's name? The the, the um, not Jimmy Fallon, but the other one, the the little short one. Maybe people know in the chat. I don't know why I never remember his last name, but I think you guys know who I'm talking. To. Jimmy Kimmel, Jimmy Kimmel. All these people trust and know those guests have already been approved to come on. 
They only bring on certain people and that's on purpose. So even the late night shows where the host has a little bit of comedy here in the beginning and they talk to the guests, all those things have already been approved. They have writers. So we are being controlled in multiple ways, not just by the news outlets, but also by comedy. So then you look at someone like Bill Maher. And if you go to this, this video, I'll show you here. If you go to uh, the Real News Network, because that's where this is located. And the name of this is called How Liberal Comedians Became Lapdogs for the Establishment Power with Lee Camp, the Chris Hedges Report. If you go to this on the thumbnail, which is probably not going to show me if even if I go all the way back because I'm on the video. But the thumbnail is a big picture of Bill Maher. Bill Maher is the perfect example. And Bill Maher is the perfect example because why? Number one, Bill's not that damn funny. Let's just keep it real. Bill's not that funny. But number two, Bill Maher doesn't just support the establishment. Bill Maher defends it. He defends corporate greed. He defends corporate interest. I saw Bill Maher on, on an interview recently, and he actually said, everybody's talking about this income inequality issue, this homelessness issue. I don't see it. Really? Bill Maher lives in Los Angeles. And you mean to tell me you don't see all those homeless people out on the streets? You don't see all the tent communities that exist in Los Angeles? Are you leaving your house and getting into your car with your own driver and they're driving you everywhere? And that's why you don't see these conditions? Because based on people that I've talked to that live in Los Angeles, they see this shit all the time. So you live there and you mean to tell me you don't see the homelessness crisis in this country? You don't see the in income inequality issues? So what I want you to understand is I think that is a lie. I don't think that Bill Maher doesn't see those things. I think that Bill Maher sees those things, but Bill Maher, again, is there to keep the status quo. That's why he'll continue to defend the Democratic Party establishment, he'll defend the corporations, he'll defend corporate interests, and that's another reason why you still see him on HBO. Something to think about. So if you haven't had a chance to do so, to watch the rest of that interview, definitely check that out. It's really good. Chris Hedges and Lee Camp, how comedians have changed in this country. I'm gonna go to some of the comments here. Zap Zen, Sabby, thoughts on Claudia de la Cruz, socialist presidential candidate. Are you going to have her on? I will reach out to her. I saw the ad the other day. I'll reach out. Thank you for the super chat, Charlie. Much love, Sabby. Thank you so much, Charlie. Gamer says Bill Maher was never funny. Yeah, I don't think he's, <laughs> I don't think he's that funny either. My comrade JB says, Sabs, the court jesters have joined the royals. They're afraid to tell the king that he has no clothes on. Mm -hmm. Danny says, young Whoopi Goldberg. Yeah, Whoopi changed over the years. She defends the establishment. She was another one. Her original stand-up was pretty deep. Thank you, M. Smith. In all fairness, Chappelle did call out Hillary Clinton. That is true. Said she, karate kid swept Bernie's knees and he didn't want to vote for her. Karate Kid swept Bernie's knees. Sweep the leg.